My name is Hallie Craig. I'm an alumna of Urban Strings Columbus and a class of 2020 graduate of Otterbein University. I'm a jazz bassist. Mrs. Willis has been a mentor of mine for most of my life. I'm very happy to be interviewing her today. Why did you want to become a teacher? I think I've always enjoyed working with, uh, with children. Even as a child, I can remember my father telling me that he would uh, see me on the porch uh, mimicking my teachers at school and having the other kids as the students and I would be the teacher. So I guess I've always, that was always a part of what I wanted to do ever since I was a small child. What were your early experiences like as a teacher? And I grew up in the housing project in Cleveland called the Althwaite Homes. And I wanted to work with kids who were like me when I was coming along. How did you come to found Urban Strings Columbus? I was a, a volunteer at the Martin Luther King Library, and I also was volunteering at Champion Middle School. And at the time, uh, Champion Middle School had a fledging strings program for the kids that were in uh, maybe I think the sixth or seventh grade. So I went to um, the teacher and asked her if we could have a couple of the kids that were in the strings program to come to the library and perform in part of the celebration for Black History Month. And so she said yes, and we had two girls that, that were kicking and screaming. They didn't want to do it, but they did it anyway. I thought, well, you know, let's see what happens. And so we started with two, and I think the, the, the largest group of a members that we've had in Urban Strings has been up to about 50. What does it mean for you for black and brown people to occupy space in the genre of classical music since it is such a Eurocentric uh, sort of genre? I think about a classical African-American piece is total praise. Mm -hmm. That's a classical piece because it, it, it's a spiritual piece and, and I think wherever we go, that's one of the popular pieces that we play that, mm. you know, that the hope that the audience just embraces and loves and so it doesn't have to be Eurocentric to be classical and we need to think about what are the classical pieces in our culture that we can lift up and, and, and share with others. Mm -hmm. Somehow redefining. Right. Um, classical music as a that, genre right. and how it evolves over time. Right. Our focus is lifting up the music, the arrangements, and the compositions of African American exactly, uh, yeah. uh, uh, musicians. What are some of your favorite memories of what Urban Strings has accomplished or worked on? One of the most exciting parts of Urban Strings is when uh, young people like you come in. In, in middle school and I look up and you're graduating from high school and then you've gone on to college and this year you were one of the 2020 graduates uh, of college that were a part of a group of kids that got started in Urban Strings and so mm -hmm. that I think that is really the joy that I feel when I look at, at you and Tristan Davis and Shalisa Warner and then I look at the kids that are in college now that are, you know, that were a part of us. And we have a large representation of young people that came through Urban Strings who are now uh, in college. And, and I think that is truly uh, the joy that, that I find and the joy that I receive. What was your upbringing like and what were some values that you learned from your upbringing that you bring into your work? My parents were uh, young people that migrated from the South during the Great Migration of yeah. black people coming from the South to the North, and they settled in Cleveland. At the time, that whole uh, area that I grew up in was like a village. You know, the parents were looking out for each other and, and looking out for each other's children. Everybody knows and it, everybody. That's right. Yeah. And if, you know, as a child, if, if, if something happened and you got into trouble, then the neighbor would tell your mom, and you know, it was too bad. And that's kind of the community you've built with Urban Strings. We're a family. Absolutely. You know? You're absolutely right. And, <laughs> we, and, right. We keep tabs on each other. We stay in touch. You right. Know? You just don't come to rehearsal and leave. You know, they don't, mm -hmm. we don't know each other. You guys are connecting with each other all week, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and doing things together, going to the movies together, you know, hanging out together. And I think that's wonderful. And, and, and that's a part of 
who we are. Fulfillment comes from not only being around like-minded people and people who you can trust, but it also comes from building a skill with your music, with your instrument, and gaining fulfillment and reward from being able to perform these pieces and to entertain people right um, and to enrich the community <laughs> right that's right yeah. that's right that's yeah. right and it's people like you um, who are in the audience at every gig at every performance patrons of the arts who are so very very important because otherwise we wouldn't survive without right you. right you know? and, I, and, and I hope that I'm serving as a role model for younger people to say to them, you know, this is something that you could and should do. When everything shut down in March, oh what my. did people turn to? Art, film, music, books, yes. literature. That's yes. all a form of art. It's art that really speaks to the human experience. Right. And it just enhances you and makes you even a better person. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you, Hallie. And you, I'm so proud of you. You've just done wonderful things. And, and I know that with your coming back to Urban Strings as a conductor and as a co-producer of our CD that's coming out, you just, you're just going to soar and, and continue to make us happy and, and do great things not only for yourself but for our community. Thank you. I have a tough act to follow, so I'll do my best. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dwight Smith, and I'm proud to be the Governing Committee Chair. Thank you very much for being with us today. I have the honor of presenting the Harrison M. Sayer Award. This award is given in honor of the Founder's Executive Director and Volunteer for more than 25 years, and it recognizes philanthropy in Central Ohio. As Mr. Sayer once stated, the best way to extend your life is to give to your community. It is my honor to announce to you the winner of the Harrison Sayer Award in this significant year in our communities, nations, and world's history, a person of high distinction and someone who loves and gives to all people, the one and only Miss Catherine Willis. A longtime educator and advocate for enriching the lives of children through education, recreation, and the arts, Catherine Willis's love for our community resonates through her service to it. As author and Columbus native Will Haygood wrote to us last week about Catherine, Catherine represents the best in all of us. As a Columbus City Schools kindergarten teacher, Miss Willis dedicated her career to instilling love and knowledge and the joy of learning to children. Nearly 50 years ago, she founded FACE, the Friends of Art for Community Enrichment, to introduce children to the culture of Africa and African Americans. Among its activities, FACE has presented local, regional, and national artist works, encourages participation in intergenerational activities, and furthers the understanding of the African American culture through artistic portrayals of community experiences. Since 1987, Ms. Willis served as a member of the Helen Jenkins Davis Scholarship Lunch Bunch, which awards scholarships to African-American students graduating from Columbus City Schools who demonstrate high academic achievement and ethical standards. Ms. Willis and her colleagues developed the fund to recognize Helen Jenkins Davis, who led the desegregation of Columbus City Schools and committed her professional life as an educator to mentoring and motivating underprivileged and at-risk black students. Ms. Jenkins Davis was in, later inducted into the Columbus Hall of Fame. More than three decades later after its founding, this organization has awarded more than $120,000 to hundreds of students. Mrs. Willis's commitment to young people in our community is further seen through her 30 years of service on the board of the Columbus Youth Foundation. This is the first supporting foundation here at the Columbus Foundation. This foundation serves the life of inner city youth by providing healthy, positive opportunities to learn life's lessons through recreation and sports. In her so-called retirement, Ms. Willis continues to advocate for children through her volunteer work. In 2007, she founded Urban Strings, an organization dedicated to supporting underserved minority youth playing strings instruments 
And if you haven't heard or seen them, I'd encourage you to do so. They are fantastic. Since its founding, the group has grown from just a few young people to more than 50. In 2019, the Columbus Symphony Orchestra recognized the success of the organization and Ms. Willis's role in it by awarding her its Music Educator Award. And I could go on and on from her dedication and work with the beloved people at St. Philip Lutheran Church to her activities as a member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority and her strength and courage and conviction to work on issues of the utmost concern to our community, those of racial equality and the arts and opportunities for all. But if you would indulge me for a minute, I'd like to share my personal appreciation for Catherine and her close friends, Gertie Tyree and others, who took under their arms and into their hearts a young know-it-all student from Ohio State University in 1976 who appeared at St. Philip one Sunday morning for worship. It was that care loving and kindness and pouring into that young student that helped him to mature to be a better person today. I know that because that student was me. I could not be more appreciative of the personal benefit and relationship that I've been honored to have and the love from Catherine Willis over the many years. Thank you, Catherine, from the bottom of my heart. Mrs. Willis's extensive service to the community leaves little doubt of her commitment to the betterment of our community and to young people here in Central Ohio. She exemplifies the spirit of and truly is deserving of the Harrison M. Sayer Award. In accepting this award, Catherine expands and deepens the definition of philanthropy defined by the honor in this award to honor grassroots not just grass top philanthropy leadership and contributions to our community. With this award comes a $25,000 grant to the nonprofit of her choice, plus this amazing glass sculpture commissioned for the Harrison Sayer Award winners. Catherine Willis, in this year to remember, congratulations on being the winner of the Harrison Sayer Award, and thank you indeed for being the best among us in so many ways for your selflessness and your courage over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight, Doug, and the Columbus Foundation. This award was a unique surprise to me because I had a personal connection to Harrison Sayer. In my other life, I was a kindergarten teacher at Trevitt Elementary School, which is in the Sawyer Housing Project community. For several years before I retired, one of my committed volunteers was Dixie Miller who was an affluent white woman that lived in Bexley and came physically into the urban black community to make a difference. Dixie was patient, compassionate, very generous, 
and committed to help the children academically and socially get ready for first grade. Dixie Miller was also the daughter of Harrison Sayer, for whom this award is named. As I reflected on what I knew about Harrison Sayer, he too was patient, compassionate, generous, and committed to helping his community as the founder of the Columbus Foundation. I accept this award in his memory, and I share this award with all of you, my family, my friends, and those of you who provided funding, prayers, and participation in those things I am passionate about. Thank you all for being the wind beneath my wings. We are so thankful for Catherine and Michael and the Human Service Chamber. Congratulations to you. As Will Haygood said about you, you represent the best among us. Education is one of the core values that we celebrate and even as part of Lead Her Talks. Why does this touch a chord so deeply with you and why has it been a you know, passion for you? I know you're an educator, but why have you continued even into retirement? Well, I know and understand that that is one of the things that's going to make a difference for all of us, uh, especially for the African-American community. Uh, my, my, uh, as I listen to the stories of my parents, I realize that they wanted an education, but it wasn't available to them. My father talked about the fact that um, his father had, had well, he, lived, he, they, he, he and my mother were born in Georgia. And uh, during the time when things were really, really uh, segregated. And my grandfather, my father's father, had owned a farm. And he had been talked into mortgaging his farm to get a second farm. Uh, by one of the, the white farmers. And so he did this. And when he got the second farm, then the bow weevil came along and destroyed the crops on both of the farms and they lost everything. So my father had to drop out of school when he was in the eighth grade. And uh, he wanted to become a surgeon, a doctor, but that never happened for him. So um, he, 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 he had to drop out of school along with his sisters and brothers, and they had to work to help keep the family together. And finally, when he was of age, he decided he was going to migrate, which many, many Black people at that time migrated from the South to the North. They called it the Great Migration. And he migrated to the North, and I think he stopped in Philadelphia, but ended up in Cleveland. And so um, he and my mother were courting, and she... Um, was uh, a graduate of high school. And at that time, if you were African-American and graduated from high school, then you were qualified to teach in the colored schools. And so she taught in North Carolina, but because um, she and my father were an item, he moved to Cleveland to get a better life and she moved to Cleveland with him. And one of the things that happened was that uh, at the time there was a whole new uh, pro program going on of ha housing for uh, urban communities for low income families. And it was called the Althwait Homes. And we were among the first families that moved into this, this housing project. And it really turned into uh, what we didn't know it then, but what we call now a village where everybody is taking care of everybody else and education was important. And, and most all of the people, all of the parents in that community were people who um, had migrated from the South. And so they were looking for a better way. But all through my growing up and I was there from the kindergarten until I graduated from, high, from college, everybody knew the importance of education. And, and um, uh, there were several very special people that came out of that quote project. And one of them was, um, oh, Stokes, Carl Stokes and his brother. And Carl Stokes was the first black mayor of a major city. And Carl Stokes grew up in that Althwaite Homes in Cleveland. So because of the fact that we had all of these people surrounding us. And right now, you know, you hear kids talk about, well, I don't want them in my business. Well, everybody was in your business when you lived in the project because it was a village. And, you know, everybody knew what everybody else was doing. And if you were misbehaving, 
And all you had to do was Miss Jones just had to call my mother, not call my mother, tell my mother that I had done something that I wasn't supposed to. And there was no question about they never ask you whether you did it. They believed what Miss Jones said. And so that was her way of being another mother for you. But that was that whole village concept, which which I view as very important. Uh, and, and again, it was a place where the, uh, the residents, the, the adults in that setting had not had an opportunity to do what they wanted to do and decided that they would come to a place like Cleveland to see if they couldn't better themselves and make it better for their children and their children's education. So I've always, there's always been a focus wherever I am on education, uh, accepting it, being a part of it, and certainly spreading it out. One of the things that I did is I always tried to talk to people uh, that I knew that could help me um, uh, make good decisions about my children being a minority in a, in, a, in a majority setting. And one of the psychologists said this to me, and I will never forget it, and I passed this on. She said to me that every African-American child should be in a setting where they are in the majority at some point in their education because that helps kind of ground them. And I see the importance of that. And with both of my children, they both, uh, my daughter started out in a predominantly black setting and then we moved to, to, to the community that we're in and uh, they both were thrown into a setting where they were in the minority. And I could just see that, you know, they were always having to kind of step back and, and as a result of having attended an Afri uh, 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 HBCU school and my husband the same, we knew that they had to have that. And, and I know that Scotty's real growth in terms of him being a man and feeling good about himself and, 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 and sure about the things that he can and, and, and will and have, have, has to have done came from that experience in that, uh, in, at Kentucky State. My next question is to you, Ms. Kathleen. How amazing is it to be inducted in the 2020 Columbus Hall of Fame? You are one of five recipients and I wanna congratulate you for that honor, it's amazing. What advice would you give your younger self knowing what you know today and all that you have accomplished? You know, one of the things that I reflect back on now and maybe it's because I'm a, a seasoned citizen, <laughs> Um, I reflect on the fact that I didn't take advantage of getting more information from the elders and from my grandparents and finding out more about who they were and what they did and, and how they got to this point in spite of. And, and I find myself now uh, thinking about young people and saying to them that no matter what it is that you have got to deal with, remember, and this is very important, you are a descendant of a slave that survived. Isn't that a statement? To be a descendant of a slave that survived. And when you look back and read about the things that the slaves had to endure, and you're a descendant of those kinds of people, then that should help you understand and realize that there's nothing that you can't do. You just have to make a decision to do it because it's in your DNA. And that's what I tell my children. It's in your DNA. You can do whatever you want to. You can accomplish whatever you want to because of that fact. That is beautiful. I love that. So my, the next question we have is for Scott. So you have worked with many women, including some of us here today, and you have yes. been raised by an amazing, incredible woman. How would you describe your mom in your eyes as her son, the man, husband, and a lead her? Uh, how would you describe her today? Yeah, so as you know, as you guys might imagine, you know, I, I just think the world of my mom, she's truly an amazing woman and role model that continues to pass on so many lessons to me and did so as both a child and, and as an adult. I, I, I would say, as from, this per, from the perspective of a son uh, slash man, just she always, again, just sort of patient, nurturing, and, I, and I su I'm assuming that it's coming from her kindergarten background, support over the course of my journey into manhood. 
uh, she and my father always gave me information and feedback on my own journey. Again, that was constructive and digestible, particularly in cases as that where I needed to learn and grow from an experience. You know, you know, uh, I was a good kid. I wasn't a perfect kid, but uh, they they knew, you know, you know, just what to give me and what to provide me to kind of keep me in line and keep me on on the on the path. As a husband, I would say my mom, my mom and dad were married for 56 years uh, prior to his passing in 2011. So their example as a couple and how I observed his treatment of my mom and sister is what I what I work to bring to my own marriage now, you know, 20 years in the game. I would simply add that putting and keeping God first is an important compass to the success of a marriage. Uh, uh, and, and a value I grew up watching my parents practice uh, and as well as my, my wife's parents practice as well. So, so you know, marriage is something that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a, a faith institution. And, and, and to me, you have to be practicing faith to be about faith to realize its, its value and its long-term benefits. And finally, just as, as a lead her, I, I, I just think I wrote down some things that that kind of describe my mom. You know, a leader is an empowered woman who is transformative, visionary, a perseverant, positive, uh, empathetic, uh, and passionate. And more importantly, she brings and shares those experiences with those around her. So, so, so as she's as she's coming up, she's bringing others up with her. Uh, which I love and, and, and appreciate uh, uh, about her as a leader. So well said, Scott, most definitely. And what an honor, honestly. Thank you so much, Scott, for sharing Catherine with us for today. And Catherine, this question's for you. We ask all of our leaders this question. And with that, this is so appropriate from one leader to another. What does leader mean to you? It means that um, you need to be willing to reach back and bring someone up with you as you move forward. Uh, Tomorrow, and and, and, uh, tomorrow is is not a part of this this segment because you guys will have, you, it it will have passed by the time you had, what I'm talking about will have passed, but tomorrow I'm getting an award as a keeper of a culture of, of, of the keeper of the culture. And it has to do with the Sankofa project that they're doing. And Sankofa is, is a philosophy where the bird is looking back as he's moving forward. And so not only is he looking back, but I'm saying that not only do you look back, but you reach back and bring somebody up with you as you move forward. And that's what I think a leader should be about. <laughs> 